okay, I'm sharing the message today and I've got here my piece of paper to pray. Because the last time I shared, I remember, <laughs> I did not pray. Not that it's necessary, but I just thought, okay. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the word that's about to come forth. Lord, I pray, oh God, that you just uh, anoint uh, what is being said, Lord, to just, and even the hearts of all of us, oh God, that you just plow it, prepare it, Lord, to receive your word, Lord. And we thank you, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, okay. So it's up. So uh, on Tuesday, when we met uh, as a staff, uh, I, Agnes asked me, so Suki, you know, you're preaching this Saturday. I said, yeah, I know. And she said, so what's the, the, you know, your title of your message? And I said, hmm, I think it is God, my team manager. And that's exactly what I told her. I said, I think it's God, my, my manager or my team manager. And then I started off with that, and somehow I ended up with in awe of God. And I hope by the end of today, you would uh, understand where I'm coming from. But we would also end in just knowing that we are such an awesome, we have such an awesome God. And I did not tell Mitzi what songs to sing. It just, you know, hey, we have the whole same Holy Spirit, Mitzi, speaking to us. Praise God. All right. So, um, you know, we have gone into this theme of from knowing to being, and it suddenly becomes very important, what is it that we know? What is it that we are knowing? And a lot of times as well, we, without even realizing, we may actually be making decisions based on something that we don't even realize where we are drawing it from. Okay, a good example would be, if there was a question put forth to you, you would probably react to it faster than you would actually have thought about it. That means before you can even reason, your answer would have come forth for certain things, right? Like if I was to say that, oh, uh, would you consider murdering someone? You don't need to reason, right? Your answer is instantaneous. It's, it's a no. And from, you know, I've just been reading this, uh, this book recently, and I just realized that, you know, we are living in a time where we are bombarded every day with a lot of knowledge and a lot of things from the world. And I came across this quote from this uh, Anglican church priest. She's a priestess. And none of us comes to what we believe by ourselves. The world has no free thinkers. We are being conditioned every day, okay? But no man is an island, right? Is that's what they say. And it's naive to think that we are not being shaped by external forces, all right? So you know what they say about a con artist? The best con artist is the person who can get you to believe that the decision that you made is your idea. That's the best con artist. And you know who is the best con artist in the world? In the beginning, none other than our preachy old serpent. I tell you, I read this and I suddenly realized, wow, you know, serpent also known as, you know, Satan or devil. Well, wow, he's a preacher. He preaches. Not only that, I think to myself, I say, well, he's an evangelist too. Really, he goes around evangelizing his message. And so what is his message? Okay, so just let's quickly just read through. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals of the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food. Oops. Oh, you did. Tickle. So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she gave some to her husband, you know, because wives are just so good that way, <laughs> who was with her. <laughs> and he ate it. See, sharing, sharing. <laughs> 
So we asked the question. So I asked the question, am I being conned? Is someone out there manipulating me? Am I being formed? Am I being conformed? Because we are always growing, right? We never stagnate. Our mind, our brain is constantly growing. And the world is forming us. And it's a constant forming. And then you ask yourself, how? Well, you don't need to look very far. It's in your hand. Yep, the smartphone. You know, recently I've been taking the MRT. It's been a long time since I've been taking MRTs. And I look around, at, you know, in the MRT car because, you know, I'm so, I'm holding on to something. Lah. You know, I'm not like those people just can stand there and just rock with the car. So I'm holding on for my dear life. I got no hand to bring up my phone, but everyone is looking at their phones. Have you noticed that? When I came to Singapore like 27 years ago, people in the MRT, you know, they used to be reading their books, their newspaper, but most of all, they used to sleep. How many of us have experienced before those persons sitting next to you and they're sleeping and they're and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, this person keeps on. Yeah, you see, like today, all these um, millennials and Gen Zs won't experience all this because everyone is just on their phones. And that's what they're looking at. And then when I, you know, like, Kepo, Kepo, look and see what are they looking at? And then you realize they're just looking at reels Instagram reels, YouTube reels, Facebook reels. I mean, oh my gosh. And they've got, and you know, the phones are smart enough, the apps are smart enough that they have these smart algorithms that will keep pushing the right ads. You notice that, right? I mean, all of y'all are savvy enough to know that. Do you know it's estimated that the average person will see about 5,000 ads in one day? That's one day, average person. Okay, don't talk about those people who are just glued to their phones. And so recently, I've just you know, come across a few of these hashtags that are trending. See, my lingo also change. <laughs> Have you heard of these? You do you? Yolo, yeah. Have you heard of YOLO? You only live once. What about this one? Follow your dream. Because by following your dreams, you will become a better and happier person. Heard about that? Or live your dream to live what you envision for yourself, what you want to become. You live your dream. Or this one, follow your heart. You know, I think I have said this to people before. Follow your heart. Sounds good, right? Do what seems right to you. Do the right thing. Do what makes you feel good. You know, I sound like a Disney cartoon, right? Not surprising because Walt Disney says, said, let your heart guide you. It whispers, so listen closely. You know, this is what the world is throwing at us. Well, if you don't, but I mean, 5,000 ads, what are they throwing at you? They are basically telling you that you are the most important person. You are the one that is the most important in your life. Don't worry about anyone else. It's just you. Do what is right by you. Trust yourself. You know what's best for you. You know, someone uh, said on, when I was re doing my reading is that self-worship is the world's fastest growing religion. That they, is it a modern phenomenon? This self-worship, is it something that's just happened now because of smartphones and social media? Nope. What did the serpent say to Eve? You will be like God. It's an age-old sermon that the serpent has been preaching and is still preaching till today, that we are our own gods. So I did a search again about selfie photos. Do you know around 93 million selfies are taken each day? 
each day, 93 million selfies are taken. On average, a person takes more than 450 selfies a year. So individuals are basically spending 54 hours a year or seven minutes a day taking selfies. Ever heard of this word called Instagram face? If you haven't heard, well, I feel like as if I'm like Gen Z. Oh, I feel so young. I'm not a boomer. <laughs> Instagram face is a social trend for women, I would say men as well, to adjust their features to conform to a single template, you know, by applying filters to their photos or even going as far as cosmetic surgery so that they would look young, poreless, unwrinkled, high cheekbones. That's your Instagram face. Okay, so when I, when I shared this 93 million with Hannah, my daughter, and she goes, wow, that's a lot of self-absorbed people. I said, that's right, we are self-absorbed today. And I put myself in it because sometimes we, like I said, we, without realizing, we fall into it. So this thing about self-worship and self-fulfillment and you know, being self-absorbed, you know, the world is telling us to turn our hearts inward. The world is telling us, look in, you know, you are numero uno, you are number one. And you know, Kenneth and I, sometimes we speak to uh, younger couples and stuff like that. Or I've got friends who are young, much younger than me. And, and then they tell me things like, oh, you know, I think I'm going to separate from my husband or wife. And then you ask the question, why? Oh, you know, because I feel as if I'm losing myself. You know, that's the reason they give. You know, I feel like as if I'm losing myself. Like, I can't do what I want to do. And then they give up. You know, and they, they're, not even, they're not even realizing exactly where we are getting this from. So, again, in my research and my studying, I came across this 2015 uh, poll by Barna. And it says here, I know it's in US, it's polling of US people, and I know it's in 2015, but you can just imagine the, mon the numbers would have got worse. And what's happening in America, guys, let's be realistic, it's gonna come here, or if it hasn't already, okay? 84% of Americans believe that the highest goal of life is to enjoy it as much as possible. 86% believe that you need to pursue the things you desire the most. And 91% affirm that the best way to find yourself is by looking within yourself. Okay, so what does this research mean? The president of Barna, David Kinnaman said, the highest good according to our society is finding yourself and then living by what's right for you. That's where society is going today. Society is basically saying, I need to take care of my three BFFs, my three best friends. Who is? Me, myself, and I. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I need to keep my three BFFs all the time happy. I think you know where I'm going with my, me sharing with this, right? I just want you all to real, I want us all to realize, because this really surprised me as well when I read and I looked at the numbers and all that that have we allowed such thinking to creep into us? That the decisions that we are making, is it coming from this fact that, oh no, if I do that, it's gonna take time away from me. It's gonna take time away from me. Or the money that I, I can give, but you know, I really need to get that thing for myself. So you know what, I'm not going to. I'm just going to save it for myself. You know, as humans, we were never designed to be our own God. Our self cannot be trusted. We can never completely satisfy ourselves. We cannot be captivated by ourselves. We are people who lie, and we are definitely untrustworthy. We are really not meant to be gods in our lives. It wasn't fear that prompted the which prompted God to make that commandment, right? To say that, don't eat of that 
the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But he knew that he had created us, that we survive at our highest potential when we fellowship with him, when we live an authentic life before God. Because man was never created to live outside of God's Godhood, his holiness, or even his presence. So in the end, what we see in that preachy sermon, serpent, is that guess who became the God? You know, he promised Eve, right? He said, you will become like God, but who became the God of this age? Satan. So basically what the con artist said was only half the truth. He wasn't a complete lie. He became the God of this age that we live in today. Right? And we know how the story goes. The serpent became God and mankind fell into death and decay. And we plunged into a life alienated from God. And today, he, as Satan still repeats the same lie, he makes every new generation and every individual the same bogus promise that we can be sovereign unto ourselves. Remember what he said to Jesus at the temptation of Jesus? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, this is the third temptation, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. You know, again, he, Satan is appealing to the infamous you in all of us, right? You know, thank God, or maybe it's a very good thing that Jesus was not hashtag YOLO. Just imagine if Jesus stood there and think, oh my gosh, I only live once. I need to grab this for myself. You know? But the story would be a very different ending if he did, but it's not. What did he say? Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Which is basically Deuteronomy 6, 13, right? The Shema. And so worship is to show reverence or adoration to something or someone. We all know that, right? And how important is worship in our lives today? Is it really that important? You know, do I, if before you became a Christian, you know, I only heard this word of worship, worship when I became a Christian. But before that, are we actually worshiping something? Yeah. Everyone is. A person will worship something, have no doubt about that. This is by a poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson, from the 1800s. That which dominates our imagination and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshipping, we are becoming. And if you think that this is just a quote, let's see what the Bible says. In Psalms 115, where you know, the, the psalmist is talking about idols. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And then it goes on to say, Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust, who trust in them. Whatever you value most in your life, you are going to become like. Whatever you worship is what you're going to become. And again, I say, we were never created to worship ourselves. Then we were never created to worship others as well, or something. To put myself first, the more inward looking we are, the more we are always going to come out lacking. We are just not good enough, not rich enough, not beautiful enough. Don't have that high cheekbones. It's just never going to work. The more inward we look at ourselves, it's actually going to make us 
a more negative person about life. So how, is, how do I decrease that God may increase in my life? And Jesus gave a hint to it when he answered the, uh, the serpent, right? I mean, he answered uh, Satan. We were made, we were wired to revere or to worship something infinitely more interesting than ourselves. So the more you revere or worship something more awesome than yourself, the more alive you become. Don't understand what I'm trying to say? Okay, let me do a quick experiment. I'm going to show you two pictures. You tell me which one makes you feel the most human, most free to become yourself. The Northern Lights at Norway or a work cubicle? <laughs> which one is it? This one, right? Do you know science is actually catching up with what the Bible has been saying? Science today is discovering that when we are in awe and people pay big money to go everywhere around the world, right? Grand Canyon. Chichon, where did you go? <laughs> Finland. You know, or New Zealand to look at the sceneries. People pay big money because they want to be awed. And I mean, how many of y'all? We are actually at our best when we are in awe. We are actually wired to be in awe. We are not meant to be self-fulfilling beings. We are wired to behold something larger than ourselves. And when that happens, okay, and this is, this is scientific, you can go and Google it. I was so amazed at the amount of, you know, uh, articles and studies that they have actually done. Science now knows that these things actually happen to us when we are in awe. We feel smaller. They've coined the word small self. We feel less important. We are less stressed or overcome by life. Chichon is nodding his head because when he saw the lights, you felt. Okay. We are more outward looking. By that, I mean we are more pro social. We are more likely to be generous, to think of others. It improves our cognition. That means, you know, when you read something, you tend to be more attentive towards it, to be more. Mm, I, your, mind is a little sh your mind is basically sharper. And then further research has discovered that all leads to a decline in depression. Because you're not looking inward anymore. You are beholding something. So in other words, all may help us to stop us from thinking about our problems and our daily stresses. All pulls us out of ourselves and makes us feel immersed in our surroundings and the larger world. Ever wonder why people put pictures of, you know, sunsets, put pictures of beautiful things on their, at their work cubicle? Or, you know, your computer screensaver is always a fantastic picture, right? Nobody puts a picture, like some mundane thing there, right? Yeah. And in today, in our lives, right, in today, there are many things that will elicit awe in us. By elicit, I mean that will draw out that, will, that we will respond in awe. There's so many things, right? There's things that will trigger your, your sense of awe. And it could be things like, you know, the birds singing. I think Susan said that. Was it Susan? Oh, Pastor, oh, yeah, that's right. Pastor Gilbert yesterday at a live group, he was saying that, you know, he just enjoys the sound of the birds singing. And then, you know, we were talking about the hornbill, which Susan mentioned. We say, yeah, he's such a beautiful bird, although he eats other birds. But you know what I'm saying? And, you know, like for Kenneth and I, because uh, we had experienced uh, a few uh, miscarriages. So when we heard, 
Ethan's, when we went to the, guy, uh, the, the doctor and we heard Ethan's heartbeat, and this was true for all our three children, right? Because even after that, I continued to have an ectopic pregnancy, et cetera, and all that. So pregnancy wasn't very easy for me. But, you know, each time I heard, we heard their heartbeat, that just drew awe out of us. We were so happy. We were so thrilled. We were in awe. You know, and awe is meant to signal the reality or someone is still more awesome. So the more awe we experience, the more satisfyingly human actually that we become. Self-worship is going to make us dry, awless, and empty. You know, I remembered when we first moved into our, uh, our current place that we live in. We are living on the 17th floor. And I think till today as well. You know, we are just so awed by the way God paints the sky every evening. Every evening, it's like he has a different picture, a different paintbrush different colors, same place, different day. That is our God. He is a God who wants to awe us. But you know, if we only wait for sunsets or the holiday trips that we can make, because at the end of the day, sunset lasts 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then what do I do? Uh oh, I'm all us. <laughs> oh my gosh, I need to go and what do I do? Travel somewhere else or you know, I'm going to look for birds. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I want to take this further and say that when we behold God in worship, in thanksgiving, when we sing about him and his greatness. That elicits awe in us, and it should. So no longer, I, I, you know, this just recently, I mean, because I, like I said, I've been reading a book, and this recently just came up to me, and oh my gosh, and I was just telling Ken today, I said, I just don't have the time to unpack it, but there's just so much here, right? Because the Bible tells us more than a hundred times, just alone in the Old Testament, we are called to revere God. It's the Hebrew word yira which expresses reverence. And then, you know, so I did a search. And this is in Deuteronomy. This is Moses speaking to the children before they enter. So he's reminding them again, right? He's giving his speech. And he says, And now, Israel, what does your Lord, your God, ask of you? But to fear the Lord, your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. So in summary, the statement is basically saying that the Lord requires in us the fear of the Lord. And so to be able to learn properly to fear the Lord, we need to learn properly how to fear the Lord, and then only we are able to walk in His ways, love Him, serve Him with all our heart and soul. But the problem today is that a lot of us, when we read that verse, we think fear is something we feel when we are anticipating danger or pain. But do you know that word yira, fear, actually means awe? It actually means to stand in awe, to have reverence. Yira, the word, includes the idea of wonder, amazement, astonishment, gratitude, admiration, and even worship. And it's the similar feeling you have when you looked at the Northern Lights or, you know, when you look at something and it draws out awe from you. It's that same feeling. And when I went on further a little bit, I realized that, you know, Moses at the burning bush, he... When he, when, he, you know, when he realized it was God there, right? When he realized it was God in the midst of the burning bush. And the, and the verse actually says in Exodus 3 that he was afraid and he turned aside. That word afraid is actually yirat. 
which is actually he was in awe. And scripture goes on to declare that the fear of the Lord leads to life in Proverbs. That word leads to life is literally is for life. Do you know that the fear of the Lord is for life for us? And I'm suddenly beginning to realize just how important it is for us to always be in awe of our God. Whoops. Did something happen to the screen, guys? Okay, so while they're bringing that up, and the awe of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? It tells us in Psalms 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praises endures forever. We start with awe, and that leads us to wisdom. And for us Christians, this wisdom is revealed in the love of God, as demonstrated by the sacrificial death of His Son. And we touch, I mean, we've been touching on that, right? That agape love of God. You know, like what Ken had said, what is mine is yours if you need it. That cross should draw out from us all. So when we look at the cross, we should be in awe because God would actually come down. He sent the serpent crusher and he crushed Satan because he loves us. And in Psalms 8, it says, Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, that is the psalmist expressing awe at God's creation. And then he goes on to say this, and that's exactly how I feel actually. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them. Church, we, we need to look so differently at the way we do worship. We need to look so differently. Why is it that we do a quiet time? Because when we step into that quiet time, that place where we're going to do our quiet time, you know, now it suddenly makes sense why they always say, give thanks to the Lord. Because when you give thanks, you are drawing out all from you. When you step in and you start to worship the Lord, it's causing and stirring your heart to be in awe. And that just is the way that we are wired. We are created to be in awe. There are other verses that just... Psalms 144, oh Lord, what are human beings that you should notice them? Or Job 7, what are people that you should make so much of us? Truly, we have a, a God who, till today, I still don't understand. But I will, when I get to heaven, why he did all that he did to save each and every one of us. His holy affection and, ge and genuine communion, communion with God comes through all. And the awesome love of God for us, we were both created and redeemed in order to know, love, and worship God. Nineteen twenty-two. This hymn was actually written, and suddenly I realize now the awesomeness of how accurate the hymn is. I mean, all of us, okay, maybe not the younger ones, but most of us should know, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And then the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That is exactly what awe does to us. 
it puts us down and it exalts the Lord. And we stand in awe. What is man that God should even look down upon us? That he should send his only begotten son to die on the cross for us. If that does not stir awe in us, I'm not sure what's going to. Can I just have the worship team come up? And we're just going to worship the Lord. And I just hope that you would actually take this message, what I just shared with you, and just approach worship in such a different way. Knowing that we are wired to be in awe. We become more of ourselves the way we were created when we behold Him. Amen, church. Like I said, I'm unpacking this myself, and I'm just so, for a lack of a better word, I'm just so awed by what, you know, I've actually come across and yeah I just hope it's all blessed you all but you know let's take this time of worship to really just stand in awe of him <laughs>